Good evening, soars of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Welcome to you and our invited guests who have joined us this evening for Alpha Kappa Alphas. This is a serious matter, becoming a college president, fireside chat with international president and CEO, Dr. Glenda Glover. This is our virtual forum and town hall. It is with great honor and humility that I again greet you on behalf of the leadership of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated as your host and moderator for this evening. The whole concept of leadership, right? It is often said that leaders help themselves and others to do the right things. They set direction, build an inspiring vision and create something new. Leadership is really about mapping out where you need to go to win as a team or an organization. And when it is put into practice, it is dynamic and exciting and inspiring. So I say to you, prepare to be inspired this evening. Dr. Glenda Baskin Glover is the international president and thus leader of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the oldest Greek letter organization established by African American college women an organization of over 300,000 members and over 1,000 chapters located all over the world. Professionally, Dr. Glover serves as the president of Tennessee State University, her beloved alma mater, and is the institution's eighth and first woman president. Dr. Glover began serving as president of Tennessee State University on January 2, 2013. And she has advanced a five-point vision that includes one, academic progress and customer service, two, fundraising and partnerships, three, diversity and inclusion, four, shared governance, and five, business outreach. She was formerly the Dean of the College of Business at Jackson State University in Jackson, Mississippi, where she led the College of Business throughout the accreditation process and spearheaded the implementation of the nation's first PhD in business at an HBCU. Dr. Glover is a certified public accountant, a licensed attorney, and only a handful of African-American women to hold a PhD, CPA, JD combination in the United States. Yes, I say that with lots of pride. Everyone knows that out of deference and respect, I always refer to her as Madam Supreme. And so now I'm thrilled to introduce our esteemed leader, Dr. Glenda Glover, who is chatting with us tonight on the topic of becoming a college president. Welcome, Madam Supreme. Thank you, Sora Starr, and good evening, Sora. Thank you, Starr, for just the, a wonderful presentation, for being such an amazing moderator for this, this, this session on serious matter. It is a serious matter. It's my privilege to greet you, Sora, on behalf of Alpha Kappa Alpha, in this continuation of our series, Serious Matter series, I am just delighted to participate in this session as we discuss college presidencies. And let's map out some strategies for those who are interested in becoming a college president. So thank you for joining us tonight and continuing to engage with us as we try to make a difference by encouraging all to pursue our dreams. God bless each of you. Oh, we're going to have a good time tonight, Dr. Glover. So because this is a topic that you clearly are an expert in, um, I guess I want to start right in the beginning. Why is it important for Black women to serve as college presidents? It's, it's important for Black women to serve as college presidents because it's another point of our leadership. Mm. We belong at the table. We've come, we, HBCUs were established uh, 185 years ago, immediately after slavery, so that we could develop into the young women, young women that we were destined to be. So it's important to be at that table and stay at that table. So it's important to be leaders in all aspects. Since higher education is our focus tonight, we're talking about leaders in higher education. So it's important that we go to the table and we take others to that table with us. 100%. That's sort of been your motto from the time you stepped into the leadership role. Dr. Glover, actually you have ably served as president of Tennessee State University for nine years now. And 
as we were preparing for tonight, I was thinking many people believe that you must be elevated through the academic ranks from tenured professor to department chair to a vice presidency or a member of the president's cabinet to actually be considered for a college presidency. So what better person to help us demystify the process of becoming a college president than our very own international president and CEO? <laughs> So I ask that question, do most college presidents take this route that I've just outlined of moving through a university? Well, there are various routes to the presidency. I'm gonna talk about two in the academy. One you just described uh, is a traditional route where you're a vice president of, of uh, academic affairs or a provost, mm -hmm. or you could be a dean. I came from a dean of a college of business or a dean of engineering mm -hmm. or a dean of some part of the university or another administrator, or that's, that's a traditional route. Right. But then there is the alternate route. That is where you, you don't go through higher education. You come from, and which is becoming more popular. Lawyers, successful lawyers become presidents. You could become a college president. Uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> my mentor here. <laughs> or uh, you come from um, the CEO of a company, you're from the military or high-ranking government officials. So that is the new, that is the new thinking. Mm -hmm. But by and large, the traditional approach is still the most acceptable one because uh, when search firms, uh, usually the search firms are hired to retain, to, to uh, get a president from mm -hmm. the university. And those search firms generally, um, it's an open process. Anyone can apply whether you're inside the university or outside the university. So they, they look for experience in higher education or they look for experience in running something, whether you ran a unit, whether you ran uh, another university, but they want you have an experience in running something. So that's why as we tell those who listen tonight, if you're interested in becoming a college president, make sure that you're running something, you're in charge of something, you can show that you can, you can make budgets and you can, um, you understand the market and all the principles of business, you understand mm -hmm. those. So whether you're inside the academy now or you join later, that's, that's the important features. Got it, got it, got it. Because you had to have those credentials. And speaking of which, there's a perception that most college presidents hold PhDs, Dr. Glover. Is that true? <laughs> um, uh, is it actually true? Or are there other uh, types of academic credentials, specific areas of study or experience to best prepare you for a college presidency? Well, yes, most college presidents hold PhDs. Mm -hmm especially for four year institutions. But the new trend is mm -hmm. the heads of Fortune 500 companies mm -hmm. or successful lawyers or some even have honorary degrees. So I mean, even more important than the credentials themselves, equally important or equally as important is the skill set. Right. The credentials consist of the degrees and the experience. So your level of experience is what's important that, you know, it's, uh, the experience we talked about earlier, you must show that you, your ability to be in charge and to make decisions at a high level. Well, that makes a lot of sense because in addition to academic credentials and areas of studies or expertise, it's clear that a successful candidate would need to possess um, a varied skill set, if you will, uh, what some people might refer to as soft skills. So what are some of the those important skills that successful college presidents um, must possess from your perspective? Well, let me give you four or five. Okay. Number one, good communication skills. You must write to express, talk to express, write and talk to express and not to impress. Ah, that's the first one. You must be a problem solver. Work with the people around you all across all aspects of higher education. You must respect the different views in the academy because diversity of ideas, I mean, that's what keeps us going. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't think alike. And people, I, I know sometimes I'll say, what do you want done? I mean, how do you, what do you recommend? They say, whatever you want. I said, no, I'd like for you to tell me what your thoughts are. He said, it's whatever you're thinking. I said, well, I don't need you to be me. I do a good job being a good job all by myself. <laughs> don't try to be me. I want you to give me your ideas. The diversity of ideas, that's what's important. Then you must have a commitment to higher learning. And this fifth one is it should come first. You must have a commitment to higher learning. Mm -hmm. you, know, you must communicate well. You can have two or three thoughts going on at one time. You must have the ability to clearly articulate your position in sometimes seconds or minutes. Because uh, the communication, you learn the art of pivoting. You can be talking in one 
stream of thought. Another may ask you another question. You have to be able to pivot without losing your cool, mm -hmm. losing your point, losing your place, you know, address them right then and there, and then come back to <laughs> your place. So that communication is really, really important. Oh, okay. So for those who may not possess all five of your points, um, even though those are important skill sets, how does one acquire that if the goal is to be in leadership at a university or a college? There are different ways to, to determine your skill set, to improve your skill set, um, mix and mingle with the right people. Mm -hmm. If there is an individual you know that you would like to have mentor you or sponsor you, befriend that person. Uh, pick up on those skills. Learn the vocabulary of higher education. Um, and just, just keep working at it and working at it. Work that plan and get it done. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Work that plan. Okay, so on a more personal note, um, I know that really successful people grow where they're planted. That's probably the nicest compliment I've ever received. Wherever you drop me in, I'm gonna figure out how to <laughs> be a part of that, that situation. But I have to tell you, you're such a natural at your job as a college president. So take us back a little bit. I want to get to into your head, um, Madam Spring. Did you always want to be a college president? <laughs> no. <laughs> I initially wanted to be a CEO of a, or a president of a Fortune 500 company. That was my goal. I started out in the corporate world. I started out as a CPA firm and moved in, up in the corporate world. And that was my dream. Then I saw that there was a need to get more black women CPAs, I mean, get more into the accounting profession. So we started helping uh, each other, helping them pass the CPA exam, because it's more than a notion. And so, and that led me to meet some people in, corp in corporate America who talked to me about um, moving up in the corporate world. Then I met someone in higher education. He said, why don't you come and teach at Howard? And I said, well, I never thought about teaching school. <laughs> So, so I went to Howard University and became an accounting professor and then moved, became the, the chair of the accounting department. And then moved to Jackson, Mississippi, became the dean of the College of Business. And I was just having a good time in Jackson, Mississippi, kind of hidden away, having a good time. You know, we were doing our own thing. And then the position at Tennessee State came open. And I wasn't interested at first because I was doing a lot in Jackson. You could be a big fish in a little pond. Uh -huh. And so I was enjoying myself. And then I decided, they just kept talking to me and of course, uh, Dr. Frederick Humphrey is, has passed away, and, and so is Dr. Hefner. They both of my two mentors who just will call me up about Tennessee State. And so I got interested in it, <laughs> so, and applied, and the rest is history. <laughs> yeah, the rest really is history. Well, I have to tease you a little bit, because as you were going through your professional background, I heard you say, okay, CPA, and that test is no joke. <laughs> then... I know to get a PhD, that doctorate is no joke. <laughs> and speaking from experience, to get a JD, that bar exam is no joke. So what in the world would possess you to go after three of the hardest things in the world? Well, you know, like you tell me, people tease me, I say, you know, I know how to pass tests. <laughs> 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 oh, Dr. Glover, I honestly can tell you, I promise God, if he would let me pass that bar exam, I would never ask for another thing. <laughs> but you really did approach um, profession as lifelong learning. It is, and it's still lifelong learning. You know, you learn every day. You, know, you don't ever stop learning. You learn more about Alpha Kappa Alpha, and that was by learning experience, moving up in Alpha Kappa Alpha, and learning all the great things about our sisterhood. So... So once you decided you wanted to become a college president, you put in place um, all the things that were necessary to secure an appointment. Um, very seriously now, I know there are a lot of people out there that are now about to start taking notes. What advice would you give to our members, speaking of Alpha Kappa Alpha, who aspire to become college presidents? Good. First thing is start planning now. Good. Don't start when the job opens. Start where you are right now put together a plan put together a timeline if i'm somewhere right now where i want to be next year or the following year 
or the following year after that, three, five years, and work on that plan each week. That timeline, tick off something, you know, periodically mm -hmm. that you've accomplished. If, if, if you don't have all the skills and credentials, you know how to develop them. Go and develop that skill set. If public speaking is not your, is, you're not great at it, join a public speaking group. You know, rehearse in the mirror. Talk to your family members. You know, if writing is not, is not your best skill, skill, skill set, then just practice writing papers, assist in doing things. Uh, working Alpha Kappa Alpha, mm -hmm. we write grants and proposals. If you don't have the doctorate, pursue one. And then stick to your plan. Stick to your plan. And don't let anyone get you off track. Stay focused. Use the methodology of Jesus. I always use as my example. He stayed focused. Nobody could get him to change his mission. He knew he came here to save the world. <laughs> so he stayed focused on that mission. No matter what they said about him, what did, they didn't face him. They called him crazy. They called him Beelzebub. <laughs> but he stayed focused. Of course, he got mad one Sunday in church you know, a couple of times and beat the people out of church, you know, mm -hmm. at the sanctuary. But sorry, you know, we're, we're both lawyers in our profession. It's called assault and battery. Yes, but let's put that aside. You know? <laughs> <laughs> But he stayed focused on his mission. That's my advice, to stay focused on your mission. Work that plan, no matter what is going on. And then shut out the naysayers. Mm. You know how many times people said to me, you know, you can't do both of those. You can't be president of TSU and president of AKA. Shut them out. Protect your ears. Don't let, don't let their shortcomings, don't let them inflict their shortcomings on you. Stay focused. And I, they say it now, so get your new conversation now. So, and then be open to, to the type of university you want to pursue. Mm -hmm. It may not be what you want right now. Maybe a community college you want to pursue. You know, when opportunity knocks on your door, you know, do you want to have an HBCU, a non-HBCU, or a large school, small school, private? Think about these things and then be ready to, to change if you need to. Mm -hmm. And and no, and be patient, because no does not mean never. It just means not now. And so and, and my advice, my biggest advice is to research, research, research. Look for its openings. Talk to people at, various, at the various universities. If you know that something's going to come up, talk to some other president. Get someone to nominate you. Mm -hmm. you know, it works a little bit better if someone, if another president can nominate you to a presidency, just goes a little bit, stretches a little bit more. Mm -hmm. and, and stay on it. Just don't give up. Just stay on it. You may not get the first presidency, but you, if you work hard enough, you will get I know a person who applied to seven and they got selected. I won't, tell you, I won't tell you the name, and I hope they're not listening. Uh, they're probably listening. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? That's okay. That just speaks to your point. Perseverance. Yes. And stick to your plan. You must have that plan, and, it's, and you have to do the work. No one's going to just come to you and just hand it to you. Mm -hmm. You have to work at it. Talk to the alumni. If you know there's a school you want to go after, even if it's a provost first, if you want to go the dean route, or if you're not in higher education at all, you want to come say, I think I want to go and work at Tennessee State. And they're going to say, I know this, this young lady who's president at Tennessee State. <laughs> I'll call her, and I'll take your call. If I know that you want to come to TSU and want to move up to the presidency, we I mean, don't try to take my seat because right. it's, it's, it's Phil right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll help. You know, we'll, we, we help each other. And you know, all the AKAs were college presidents. And we got together earlier this year. And we talked about mentoring more SORWARS to, to take these leadership roles. We need more SORWARS mm -hmm. to, to lead in higher education. We had a session recently about running for public office. We need more SORAs in these positions. And so I'm always eager and, and anxious to assist another SORA who wants to become a college president. If I think you're on the right track, I'll help you lay it out. If mm -hmm. you're not on the right track, we'll say, well, you're, you're over here now. Let's give them a little bit more to the, to the center. And let's get to these courses. And let's see if we can get you um, a, a speaking engagement on the campus. Or can you volunteer? to make a speech somewhere. You have to be noticed by someone there. Or will you write an article that's 
that's controversial. You know, that's how you get noticed in higher education. I wrote an article on bank lending and discrimination in the very in, in underserved communities. And it made the paper. I mean, it was published, but it made the paper also. And I was had to go go around Mississippi and talk about mm -hmm. the bank lending and the census tracts. It was yeah, 15 years ago. <laughs> it yeah. could have been yesterday, but it was 15 years ago. Same so, issues. <laughs> yeah. So do something controversial. Write something. Not do something. Write something controversial, and and get some attention in in in, in the academy. Mm -hmm. And so get your name out there. So there are different ways and different approaches, but just make sure that you stay on track. If you want to be a college president, you can't put it aside and say, I'll come back to it later. Just start it, keep going, keep working at it. And talk to everybody you know who you know can help you. Don't be embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. and don't be shy about it. Just go out there and just talk and, and meet, your friend, meet your friends. The SORWAs will be able to help you. None SORWAs will help you. Well, you know, it's very interesting because you and I have talked over the past few years um, about this whole concept of mentoring, but what you've also described is sponsorship. Yes. Mentoring is one thing, but sponsorship is another. That's when someone, it has your back when you're not in the room. That's right. Who can speak to your skills and your skill set and your preparation when opportunities come up. Exactly. That sponsor, the mentor, we're all mentors, but that sponsor, when you're not around, that sponsor will say, how about Linda Glover, I noticed her. Let's bring her in. And that sponsor will push you and will take you to that room. You're not, you're not there with them, but they've taken you anyway. And that sponsor is what we need. We have a lot of mentors, but it's when you get to the sponsorship, that's when you really got somebody on your side. Yes, indeed. So there, there's a whole lot of preparation to get there, but once you get there, there's a whole lot of things that you need to be good at. And one of your gifts, and I know this to be fact, is your ability to get people to embrace your vision and then help bring it to fruition. Another area in which we know you are gifted is fundraising. And <laughs> I know for a fact that is a big, big <laughs> deal for colleges and universities. So must a successful college president uh, candidate really have strong fundraising abilities? Absolutely. That's part of the presidency. If you don't have it, you'll develop it mm -hmm. because you'll hire. If you don't have the strong fundraising skills, you have to get somebody who does mm -hmm. and keep that person close to you. And then, because you have to close the deals many times. You know, I do it all. I have to go out and raise some money. You know, go to the federal government, ask for money for different contracts and different grants, and then talk to different corporations. We have a lot of sorrows in, in corporations who will assist. And mm -hmm. so I've been able to tap into many of those. Because we're in every room already. <laughs> so room. you know where to go. But a lot of people find it difficult to ask for money. You can't be shy mm -hmm. because a student's career might depend on it. A student's career might be at stake. If you're not going to ask for the money, then you're going to come up short somewhere. So call people you know at companies who have access or have money to access or have managed, managed money. Not what you what you own is what you can manage, what you can control. And so those who control money. So talk to them and just learn that art of fundraising. It's something you have to just pick up. It's a skill set. You just can't be afraid to ask for funding because higher education needs it. No one has enough. Well, I don't know of any HBCU that, that has more than enough funds. Mm -hmm. You just don't have it. <laughs> you know, I, um, I developed my own expertise in fundraising in the political sphere. Um, over the past few years, and <laughs> uh, I've become very, very good at it, very astute at it. Um, and what I found is when you find people with a commitment to the same thing that you are committed to, uh, those people are very much willing to join in your vision. And you've done such a really great job in this area. When I was dean of the business school at Jackson State, the president talked to me about becoming a chief fundraiser and being dean of the business school. I said, I want to do both, you know, because business school deans raise money, you know, mm -hmm. engineering deans raise money. There are some deans, all deans should raise money, but some do it better than others, you know, because those fields are just, they're more hot button fields. And mm -hmm. they're, they're more, there's more funding available. So 
you do your job, you do such a great job, and they'll try to give you <laughs> more, 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 more work. More they work. want you to raise money because that's the one skill set that men and you know, just don't do. I'm not the greatest at it, but I, I've mastered to the point where you know we can get get the money for us to survive. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, we talk fundraising. We talk vision. How important is networking in one's efforts to become a college president? Oh, networking is is very very important. You have to. How do you approach it? You start building your network right now. Mm -hmm. You know, the network reflects of higher education. If you want to be a college president, you're going to have to network. What's the saying? If you don't network, you will not work. Right. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so get to know the language. Join the higher education membership organizations. Uh, attend their conferences. Reach out to people in higher education, uh, the state legislators. Uh, the social organizations, find the credible uh, membership organizations and see if you can attend their conferences. Again, volunteer to speak at one, uh, at some of the conferences. The networking is so important mm -hmm. because you're going to need someone in your circle to represent you at some point, not legally, mm -hmm. but to represent you in getting money and getting a, into a door. You know, so I met several of the, the members of Alpha Kappa Alpha. And those who were not member, Marsha Fudge, you know, mm -hmm. who's not a member of Cal Alpha. But I just, but I met so many of our of our, our sisters, sorry, Kamala, Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, just had Nakima Williams. We there's so many of them who will be able to, mm -hmm. to take you by the hand and pull you through and help you get the fun that you need. Because you have to network. Uh, if you don't network, then you're missing out on a major opportunity. You know, I consider networking to be one of my areas of expertise and um i've had such great member um, mentors over the years from uh so our sister uh frederica wilson oh, who yeah, frederica. um has been my mentor since i was a teenager she's mine now <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course uh bonnie watson coleman yes. from new jersey um i've known since i was a young kid she and my mom were very and good friends so i hear she's retiring I know. I'm so sorry about that. And for Eddie Bernice. Yes. And I just think about the women who have impacted on me, our late Supreme Basilis, uh, so Faye, Faye B. Bryant. Bryant. Mm -hmm. um, but the, it, it was not for the ability to say, oh, I know these people. They saw something in me, but they also encouraged me to do the same thing for other sisters exactly. who were coming along the well, way. And so, sorry, Frederica Wilson. Oh. Brought me in to, to, to speak before the legislature, to testify before the House Education Committee. And that's all because of networking mm -hmm. and because she had just, we had been in the same circles asking for money. And she had watched that and she said, and she saw the passion that we have for HBCUs. Well, she saw that passion. She said, I want you to, will you testify? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> but I did. And she's just, she's a giant. Is there any special way you approach it? I know for me, one of the things that I do all the time is I'm a good follow upper. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, I, I go to an event um, and I meet someone, I always follow up to make sure they know that um, there was an impression that yes. they left with me. What about you? And that's the same thing. And you have to do that. One, it shows you have manners. Yes, ma'am. You know? <laughs> and two, it shows you know the ropes and what you're doing. And it's important in higher education. If you want to be a college president and someone has invited you to a function, always, always, always send them a thank you note. It doesn't take much energy. It can be a, a canned note that you've sent to others, but send them a thank you note. Then they realize that, you know, th there's something special about getting a note, a note of thanks. Mm -hmm. I think there's so many requests. It's, it's, it's a welcome change to give a thank you note. <laughs> oh, that's such a great, great, great piece of advice. Um, Dr. Glover, many people regard college presidency as a male-dominated profession. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, we have some fabulous women presidents. <laughs> but what percentage of college presidents are, in fact, women? Well, one, let's say, yes, it is more male-dominated. It's getting better. It's growing. But still, of all college presidents, 29% are women. That's overall for all. But for HBCUs, it's about 24%. Mm -hmm. It's a little lower. There are 
Let's see the HBCU. There are 12 SORAs who are HBCU presidents. Uh, there are five more SORAs who are non HBCU presidents of four year colleges. Mm -hmm. So if you got five that are HBCUs, you got five non HBCUs. So that's 17 right there of four year colleges. And you got seven more who are presidents of community colleges. So we have 24 SORAs who are presidents of, of, of universities. That is a great number. That's a great number. We've talked to several of them when we yes, did one of our town absolutely. halls. It's male dominated, mm -hmm. true enough, but Alpha Kappa Alpha is making this mark in higher education and the college presidency. That's why I'm happy we're having this forum tonight. So we're gonna have more college, more HBCU presidents and non HBCU presidents. That's fantastic. Um, okay, let's get to the nitty gritty. I can imagine that there is no such thing as a typical day in the life of a college president. In fact, I read just this past Sunday, you appeared on the American Music Awards to introduce a performance. <laughs> and I wasn't performing. I was introducing. I didn't perform. Can you believe that star? They left you out, right? <laughs> but it was to introduce a performance of the Tennessee State alum. But um, I'm going to ask you it anyway. Describe for our members what one of your days as president of Tennessee State University looks like. And go ahead and give us it all because I've been with you as you've juggled <laughs> it all. So I would like them to know. Well, there is no uh, single day that's, that looks like something. I mean, you know, I mm -hmm. can't say what it looks like because it, it doesn't, it just, it just happens. But let me just say how you start the day off before you get to the campus. Every single morning, you must start with prayer. Mm. And I lead two large organizations. So you must pray each morning. You don't know what may show up in each day mm -hmm. in either organization that lord i need you to shield me today protect me the blood the blood that gives me strength from day to day should never ever lose its power so you must start with prayer and then when you get to the campus you don't always know what to expect but meet with your team have you know you have to have some strong direct reports you must hire talented people so you have to meet with the students there's, there's going to be a student problem there's going to be something going on in financial accounting. There's mm -hmm. something going on in the community. So every single day, there's going to be some, something that you have to handle mm -hmm. <laughs> without every fail. And you won't know what it is until you get there. But some days are peaceful, more peaceful than others. That's why some days are there, they're not. But I don't want to present it as being such a, because <laughs> I want everybody to apply. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So we, don't want to, we don't want to scare you away. We'll pull it back a little bit. But just be prepared. Just be prepared for just not to know what's going to happen, but be able to think your way through it, work your way through it, pray your way through it. You make it. You make sense. You make very good sense. Um, well, here, there's a whole lot of fun aspects to it. Every college president loves the interaction with the students, the camaraderie with the other educators and the service you get to provide to the community. But um, not to scare anybody away, but I know that every day can bring certain challenges, especially for HBCU. So we'd be serious for just a bit. What was or is the biggest challenge you've had as a college president? Well, that challenge is with HBCUs in general. It's always funding, but even bigger than funding is a lack of a solid advocacy base. Mm. There are no advocates for HBCUs. If we don't, overall, it's a lack of that advocacy, that base that's missing because other schools, the, the majority of institutions have people walk in the halls for them all the time. Someone to walk the floors of the Capitol, that's what we need at both the local there's a state level and in Washington. That's, that's overall for HBCUs. But for me personally, my biggest challenge is the funding owed to Tennessee State University yes. by the state of Tennessee because of years of underfunding, diverted funding, you know, the land grant funds, when funds were provided to the other land grant university in the state of Tennessee. Now we're provided to TSU. So we're trying to correct that. It's been years, but you know, I always say, it's never too late to do what's right. Yes, ma'am. So we're still pushing for that, and we're hopeful that we're gonna make a dent in that funding that's owed to us. 
So is the government being supportive um, of HBCUs? And what, if anything, can we do? The state government is what we're talking about now. Right. Federal, federal government's fine. Mm -hmm. um, they made a commitment to federal level to HBCUs, and it's working. We got the funding. Well, the bill hasn't been signed yet. We just, we're, we're, we're lobbying and praying mm -hmm. that, that the Senate comes through. Lord willing and the creek don't yeah. rise, as we say, right? <laughs> but the state is has a level of understanding now they didn't have. Mm -hmm. So uh, the more they understand, the more they see the point and see how, mm -hmm. how can you have two children in the state and you treat one like a king, a queen, and the other like a stepchild mm -hmm. and expect the two to operate and grow equally and produce equally. Mm -hmm. So they see that's an impossibility. So once they get that, and they're getting it now, we, is, we have some great expectations for next year. Okay. Lord willing and the creek don't rise, <laughs> as I would say. So, Dr. Glover, you've emerged as a leader among leaders as a college president. Um, uh, from your service on various committees to being asked to speak all over the world and represent education, um, you're the longest serving woman HBCU president in addition to being widely recognized and highly regarded as a national advocate for HBCUs. We've seen a lot of that this evening. What do you think has been your greatest fulfillment in serving as a college president? There's no one greatest fulfillment. Okay. When I see students graduate, that is a fulfillment. When I take a first generation college student and pour into her, pour into him the basic skill set to compete in the global marketplace, that is fulfillment. When we can instill confidence in a student that's broken, that's fulfillment. So my fulfillment is seeing the students succeed. That's the greatest fulfillment, the greatest success story that we could ever discuss. Um, your commitment to young people is just phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal. Would you say that's your favorite part of being a college president? It is. It is. The students, you know, because they know where you park. So, <laughs> so I get in at 6 o'clock in the morning. That's the one thing you say about that day. I get there. I pull up in my, my spot at 6 o'clock in the morning so I can have a couple of hours to myself because Alpha Kappa Alpha work, you know, I don't want to do it between 8 and 5 or 5.30 because I don't want to be with the first, on the front page of the paper. You know, so, <laughs> so I'll take my AKA calls. I'll just do things that morning. But I see the students, they, they know my schedule now. So they'll, well, we'll, we'll, rock, we'll walk together around the, the, the track field, the track, the, foot, the track, and they will join me. But well, of course, there's a lot to complain many times, you know, <laughs> about some professor didn't show up or something, the food in the cafeteria, or they need some more parking. Many times it's complaints, but, but you love it because you are helping the students. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the spirit of help. You know, you can help somebody. That's what it's all about. And so that's the best part about it. When you say the most fulfilling commencement was last Saturday, and we conferred almost 700 degrees. I mean, that is, I mean, that is the most special feeling a president can have is when they see the students walk across that stage and you hand them that degree. That is just, that's, that's more than, I mean, that's, that's the truest blessing of being a college president. <laughs> I'm just curious, what does education mean to you? Knowing how to find the answers, help others, and make it all worthwhile. <laughs> That's not the best answer that people like to hear. No. So education is developing the talents, developing your talents and helping others develop their talents. So they'll know how to find the answers and succeed in this, in this global world. Do you, I, you know, it's also often been said that um, talent can be universal. We all have some talent, but we know that opportunity is not. Opportunities are not always there for black and brown students. Absolutely. That's um, what you have been doing at Tennessee State University and with other um, African American uh, college presidents, you're sort of trying to make sure that playing field is even to allow um, black and brown students the opportunity that we're talking about. And, and that's true. That's absolutely. That's what, that's what makes it all worthwhile. 
where you see students who come from broken homes, they come from low income communities. I mean, our population is our population. You play with the hand you've been dealt, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't bid a, a six no Trump if you got a four low in your yes. hand. Well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. My Church of God in Christ friends. <laughs> <laughs> She's just using that. it as an example. Just using it as an example. <laughs> just using it as an example. <laughs> well, I grew up, my friends I grew up with, okay. But you're right. You have to, you know, it makes it so worthwhile when you can see students and meet them where they are and take them where they need to be. You know, they, they have a destiny. And you keep them on track. Don't let anybody take you, get you off track and end your destiny, ruin your destiny. I uh, love yes, that ma very, very much. Um, that was the forum part of this evening. I would love to take a couple of uh, questions for a, a quick town hall part. Um, and the first question actually comes from Sir Hall Ali Holiday from Ro Romeo Omega, Omega. Yep, oh, so um, in Washington, D.C. That's our North Atlantic yeah. region. And she asks, um, Dr. Glover, your administration has created, created some amazing legacy moments, especially the one million for HBCUs. But as a political operative, I am most thrilled by your social justice efforts. What do you see as your social justice legacy? And is there anything you would challenge the members to address in the coming months? <laughs> so Sora Holly really wants some marching <laughs> orders right now, it seems to me. Well, thank you, Sora Holly. It's good to hear from you. Well, the, I thought you'd go in another direction about the, the money, the, the one million dollars in one day. Oh, we'll come right back and get that. Uh huh. We're gonna come right back and get that. That's I didn't let that go. But I would say the role we played in the get out the vote. Mm -hmm. Yes, year. indeed. That was so significant. You were an integral part of that. Our connection committee, we worked with the Divine Nine to get their strategy together, and then the voter protection mm -hmm. to, and now we're working with the 2022 midterm elections, because a lot is at stake. Mm -hmm. We would need the same energy, the same commitment to get out, get that vote out, mm -hmm. because uh, we, worked, we worked wonders last year. And to the extent that, remember, they talked to us about, we put had some input to that second seat, that second person, that ticket. You were there with me. Oh, yes. We, we had those meetings, those in-person meetings, those Zoom meetings. Well, we had several meetings. Oh, yeah. And we said, here's our candidate, and here's why. Mm -hmm. and so we sat right across and talked it over with them, with the persons that be. And so, right. We were at the table. <laughs> at that table. So and that's our legacy. We want to leave. It's the role we played. And getting, get, we can't, because we can't tell anybody who to vote for. But we say, go to the polls, get you out to the vote. You'll figure it out once you got there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but our role was to get you out there to vote. And so I think that was, that's what we did for social justice. So now we got to keep that up because it's not over yet. In fact, it's somehow, it seems like it's, it gets, some days it's worse than others, you know? The way they're treating this, I'm on Ivory case, it's just, it's almost unreal. I heard things today that just made you just want to cringe. Yeah, but you, you say to yourself, there's still so much work to be done. And Dr. Glover, you've been working in this area for such a long time in social justice. Um, do, you, do you see us moving towards a, a good path? Uh, let me take you back a moment. When I was a very, very young, I watched, my dad was a civil rights leader in Memphis, and I watched the little boy's house burn down. Mm -hmm. Well, not little boys, the parents. My friend was, was the little boy. Because they would not let the fire department assist. Mm -hmm. That's how the racial climate was in that day. And so I said at that moment, I'm going to become a, a fireman or a policeman, or some kind of official so I won't let this happen again. I was seven or eight, you know. <laughs> so, what, what aspiration? <laughs> so I would watch my dad. I say, well, so the next day, my dad led a march downtown to get fire protection. You know, in our, in our neighborhood, we got it, you know. <laughs> so I was I right there. That. With him, I you know? love that. <laughs> so I've had this, it's, an, it's been just a part of me. When we see something needs to be worked on, 
let's do it because uh, this is the time this the time is now so is it getting better or is it getting worse to stay the same we have to be optimistic about things when we see i mean i'm optimistic about where we are politically mm -hmm. with this administration it's been finished hbcus we're working on minority businesses you know, we're doing things we're going places we haven't been before so i'm excited about where we're headed I don't care about the numbers plunging now. They'll mm -hmm. come back up once this bill passes. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, absolutely. <laughs> so, so I think we're, we're on the right track. Um, so getting back to the first part of uh, uh, Sora Holly's question, that $1 million in a day <laughs> goal. Um, I've watched, I've now watched you do this personally twice. And it's the most awesome goal ever. For those who don't know, Explain it to them. Well, being a college president, I see firsthand the financial needs of HBCUs. Mm -hmm. I see it. I mean, I live it every day. And so when we were planning our, when I had my team, we were talking about HBCUs. They said, we need a big awareness campaign. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, I said, we don't need awareness. HBCUs don't need awareness. We're already aware of it. We we're need aware. money. Right. So, so let's do and aware, let's do them, see if we can raise money for HBCUs. Mm -hmm. And then somebody on the team, I don't think it was, I don't think I, I was the one, maybe, so I, I can't remember, we said, let's do a million dollars in one day. And somebody said, what? You know? I love it. I love so it. With, you know, with 300,000 sorors, and their families and friends, we ought to be able to do it. So the first year was the, was a, a novel year because we did uh, 1.2 million. The second year was the hardest because we'd already, you know, the novelty was over. Right. And so we were sweating out. My sister said, my biological sister said that when she saw so many emails, I mean, she just started deleting them without opening them. I said, how could you do that? You know, I'm depending on you. <laughs> and so we just, and we did it. And then we did it again, mm. three, and then the fourth year, 2.3 is still coming in. We I saw that. I, I was said, I was blown away. So we said we're looking at some things now. We said we're going to go back now and just we have we can do some funding for some more universities. We can do some things with the house. We, you know, we're trying to get at the Hes I think I may have shared with you that at the Hedgeman Lyles house in St. Louis. When a, we, can, we have the opportunity to get the house, get that house, and make it a museum for HBCUs and her museum her legacy so we have some we have time to do some things now we're so excited about the fundraiser you know so <laughs> so, so you are I'm, putting that expertise <laughs> to work when it comes to fundraising so but i like doing it it's, it's, it's you know it's, it's sometimes we go to lunch with people i say i said to the president of one of the banks in nashville i said can we have lunch and he said what does that mean i said you know lunch meal he said, Dr. Glover, we got a reputation. There's no such thing as just sitting and having a meal with you and we use the word become more engaged. That's a code word for mm -hmm. money. I said, really, is that what you think? So at lunch, I said, I said um, I'll get the check. He said, no, 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 I'm getting a check. But that's all I'm giving to you. She was at lunch today. <laughs> But I got half a million dollars out of it. You know? See, and you, that is a living, breathing example of what we discussed a little earlier, the power of networking. Yeah. You said every meeting, every opportunity. That's right. You can, something can come out of that. And that's a perfect example of that. Let me, I see a second question that's come in. This comes from source Sydney Dillard from Theta Omega Chapter. That's here in the Central yes, Region. Theta Omega. Um, she asks, we know that our sorority is resilient and stands the test of time, but how should we counter negative sentiment regarding sororities and fraternities on college campuses these days? We're improving. Mm -hmm. I think it was so much hazing that had gone on and we were doing, you know, the hazing has cost us a lot. It's cost us reputation. It's cost us money. It's costly. But then uh, I think the last election, they saw the, the power of the divine nine. And then when Vice President Harris 
Well, at that time, she was not Vice President Harris. She was Senator Harris. Yeah, when she said by the Divine Nine her speech, and we know about that. Oh, know? yes, indeed. <laughs> I thought we'd lose it at that point, though. <laughs> yeah. When she said Alpha Kappa Alpha, Divine, and my brothers and sisters who HBCUs, I mean, that brought it some more credible. People said, what's the Divine Nine? I got that question so much that next day. Mm -hmm. What's the Divine Nine? Not uh, not just from majority of uh, institutes. I got there from just different people. What's mm -hmm. the Divine Nine? So we're on the spotlight now. We're on center stage. So we tell people, don't do anything that make us look uh, like yesteryear. Yes. Because we've come a long way. There's still some who want to be sanctioned and punished. But everybody has a few bad apples. But by and large, we're doing great things and we get those, get their reputation out. I think all nine, we're doing great things. So the more bad news out there, you count it with good news. Mm -hmm. And so that's how we're going to have to do this. When something bad happens, just count it with some good news. But there's enough good news to outweigh that. And there'll be some bad news out there. There'll be some bad apples. But can't that, that deter us from our mission? And our mission is to keep it going, to make sure that we train the young women to be the greatest they can be, to, to be who God has called them to be. So we don't worry about the, the negativity because it's going to pass. The news, what's the news life? You know that. Mm -hmm. How long was the shelf life for news? A day or two, day and a half now? Yes. So, <laughs> so let that go. Just put it behind us. Just keep on walking and we'll, you know, we'll get there. I love that so much. Uh, a couple of people want to get to know you a little bit better. Um, Dr. Glover, what's your favorite thing to do when you have a moment? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. People say, you see, my husband said, develop an answer to that question. Are you going to get it? You know? So I said, I don't like to, I don't have a chance to just get a pick of a book and read it. I surf the internet all day, every day. I look at news. I'm a news junkie. I go from CNN to MSNBC, you know, to the internet, to whatever's going on. I just, I'm a news person. So I'm listening to news all day, every day. And then I'm, um, I'm, on the, I'm just on the internet, you know? <laughs> You are really a news junkie, <laughs> and you send you send me text messages of things that Five you've read, <laughs> which I like that. I absolutely like that. I'm going to ask you one last question myself. Um, if you could wave that uh, black girl magic pink and green wand, and I know black girl magic gets on your nerves sometimes, but I like the whole concept. I've got a black girl magic pink and green wand. What is the one wish you would want to make sure came true, with or without the wand? The Black Girl Magic wand. Yes, without <laughs> because it. Because you know, I always say, I, people like to wear black, black Girl Magic, and it's all right, but we don't really have any magic. You know, we work so hard for everything. It's not magic, it's work. <laughs> it's not magic. <laughs> but um, that our sisterhood, if I had one wish, it's that our sisterhood will live up to the ideas of our founders. That's my one wish, that we would be the sisterhood that was started in 1908, and that was expected to continue like that, that we love each other and that we support each other, we're authentic mm -hmm. and honest with each other, that we treat each other as sisters, that we're there for each other no matter what. Now, this is the scripture. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. So, for old folks used to say that one can't fall for the other, you know. So, that's my prayer that our sister remains strong and love is the essence of our very being. You know, I have to tell you, um, Madam Supreme, it just, it's, it's extremely, it's an extreme honor to sit down and talk to the leader of our sisterhood. I think you know how much the sorority has meant to me. Uh, I became a member of the sorority as a teenager and had wonderful, great mentors throughout um, my supreme. growth. Um, I got to be second supreme at the Basilis. That's the highest ranking undergraduate in our sorority yes. um, and do programs for our undergraduate members. But it also just it taught me a sense of self yes. as a young person. Yes. And I don't think that I would be Star Jones without um, what Alpha Kappa Alpha gave me. I um, love it. And you are the embodiment of what Alpha Kappa Alpha's 
to capture a vision fair means. Mm -hmm. So it has been an amazing opportunity to oh, sit with you. Yes. Uh, someone that I consider a sister and a friend, but learned so much from you. As we wrap up the evening, I'd like to again thank our international president and CEO, Dr. Glenda Glover, who never ceases to amaze me as she helps us all continue to provide service to all mankind and exemplify excellence through sustainable service. To close out our evening, please allow me to remind you that great leaders don't set out to be a leader. They set out to make a difference as she has so eloquently shown us today. It's never about the role, but it's always about the goal. And leadership is the capacity to translate vision into reality. Dr. Glover, Madam Supreme, you have given us a master class on both this evening. Thank you so very much. And thank you, Sora Star. Thank you, Sora. On behalf of the leadership of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, I thank you for joining us and I wish you a great evening. And a happy Thanksgiving. And a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>